to speak to you. Um, uh, and the title of the message is Believing into Breakthrough. Believing into Breakthrough. And uh, listen, can I tell you that you and I live out of what we believe? You're not what you think, not what you hope or wish. How you live is out of what you believe. In other words, our believing, the things that happen down here determine our reality. No, listen, truth doesn't determine your reality, your believing does. Not truth. Many people uh, live with a reality that's not true and they live out of that reality, even though it's true. Proverbs 23 verse seven says this, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. For as a man thinks, not in his head, but in his heart, so is he. You don't live out of, you make decisions with your head, but how you live and how you see life is determined by what you believe in your heart. So we live out of our heart. Our believing determines everything. Your reality is determined by your believing. And the trouble is, your reality can be built on a lie. Because you could believe, you could be believing a lie, and therefore your reality is wrong or going the wrong way. Uh, not because it's truth or not; it's because you are believing in a lie. What you live and what you do in life is determined by what you believe. I had a, a friend in America who's a pastor, and um, I went to visit him a few years back, and he was a mess. He was man. I walked into his house; it was just terrible. He was sobbing, and uh, he, his mother had just passed away. And uh, after her death, he discovered uh, information that would shatter his world, and uh, it really did destroy him. Uh, it really made uh, where he'd come from, what he believed for so many years, just so invalid. His world, his reality, had been moulded by a lie. His whole time that he'd been alive, he would believed something that wasn't true. And at this moment, he just found out the truth. He, he didn't know uh, what to do with it. He didn't know how to process it. His whole world had been moulded on. His reality was determined by, not by truth, but by what he believed. You see, his mother had given him up as a young boy. He grew up in a, in a, a children's home, like an orphanage sort of thing. And he'd never met his father. But his mother had always told him that his father was a horrible man that he was angry and alcoholic, he was unfaithful, and uh, to be glad he never met him and to be glad that he wasn't your father because he was a terrible man and would have made a horrible father. This had such an effect on my friend uh, that his whole growing up, it, it so challenged him and so disturbed him that he decided because of that truth that his, well not his truth, that word that his mother had said about his father, that he too would not be a father. He would be a horrible father, just like his father. And therefore, because he loved kids, he would decided early on that he would never have children so he wouldn't hurt them, so he wouldn't disappoint them, so he would not be like the father that he had. But after, and this happened after he got saved, he, he um. He, uh, he became a pastor. He'd been married over 20 years and he never had had children because what he believed about his father and what he believed about himself. But after his mother died, he was cleaning out a home and uh, he found some letters that had been written to his mother by his father years and years ago. And he sat down to read them. And this is what one of them said. It said, I've tried my best to be a good husband, but I can't take it any longer. Your continual unfaithfulness and your wild behaviour is killing me. I cannot stay with you any longer. I'm not coming back. His father wasn't a bad person. He was a good man trying to make ends meet. As a matter of fact, it was never his problem. As a matter of fact, he was his mother that had the issues. She was unfaithful, uh, she was a drug addict. She had all these things going wrong, yet she'd blamed it on, her, on his father. And because he believed the lie, he set his reality into place uh, of that he would never have children. He was devastated, he was destroyed. I sat uh, with him for hours and, and he cried and he couldn't believe because he loved kids and he never had one because he believed that his father was a terrible father and he would be the same. Can I tell you today, it's not truth that determines your reality. It's what you believe that determines your reality. It's not truth, it's what you believe. And I, and I look at even around the world today, how many people have a wrong belief about God? They, 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 they don't believe in God. Like there's many people who don't even believe there is a God. 
They don't believe there is a God. And then there's a whole bunch of other people that if there is a God, well, obviously He doesn't care. Look at the world, the, mess, the, the way the, the world's in a mess. Look what's gone wrong. So even if there is a God, it's not a God I can trust and I can care. And because they believe either there is no God or either they believe that He's a God doesn't, that doesn't care, then they live their life out of that reality. They live, they live their life in a place where they miss out on the wonderful things that God has for every one of them. His grace, His mercy, His ability to help us through situations, uh, His ability to give us answers when we need, to give us strength and to empower us. And they live this life struggling and fighting in this world because they believe there is no God or they believe that if there is a God, He doesn't care about them. You know what? If you live your life with that reality, it's all about what you believe because the truth is that God loves you so much that He gave His only begotten Son to die on a cross for you and I 2,000 years ago. And in that place, we were set free. Something happened, something changed. The world was never the same. And because of that incident, you and I can walk into a place with this God that does exist and a God that does care and He can change your reality tonight. He can change, he can, everything about your world can change just by changing what you believe tonight. I believe there are people in this house tonight, you've come and there's no concept of who God is or maybe you've grown up in a place where God obviously is a God of judgment or is a God of anger or is a God that doesn't care. And tonight you're living in a, a reality that's not based on truth. You're living in a reality that's based on a lie. And tonight you can change what you believe and you can change the reality of your world tonight. You can make a decision right here, right now. That says, you know what? I've been, it's been a lie. Just like, the, just like my pastor friend who, who, who thought that he'd be such a terror. Man, his whole life was determined by a lie and he didn't outwork what could have been because he built his life on the lie. Today, it's not truth that makes your world a reality. It's what you believe. Tonight, you can make a decision to believe in God because He's true, because He's real. Uh, you can make a decision here to come to God. Why? Because He'll help you be all that you're meant to be. You know that struggle you're going through? You know that thing you don't know what to do with? He's gonna help you with that tonight. Right here and now, if you change your believing, you will change your outer reality. You will change the life that you live. Not just a little bit, but there will. you close your eyes and bow your heads right across the auditorium tonight? God, I come and I thank You right now that You're able to touch lives, to change people's hearts. And God, right now, I know there's people that God, who, who believe sincerely that You weren't there. They believe sincerely that You're a God of judgment who didn't care. And they base their life not on the truth, but on a lie. But tonight, Your heart's so for them, Your heart's so towards them that You wanna allow them to respond to a decision to get to know You. And I believe right across this auditorium, there are people right now saying, you know what, if this is true, I need Jesus. If this is true, then I wanna make a decision to live for Him. Right across this room tonight, we as a church would love to pray with you and help you be all that you can be, to help you make a decision that will allow God to enter into your world and your reality will change for the better. Eyes are closed, heads are bowed, and we, we want to pray with you, we wanna help you make decisions. So right now, if that's you tonight, if you're reaching out and say, you know what, I, I, I wanna make a difference, I want something, I need this tonight, then would you just, look, reach out from your heart, would you just give me a wave, slip your hand up and say, you know what, that would be me tonight, pray with me tonight. Just slip your hand up wherever you're seated tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Others tonight, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, at the back, thank you tonight. Over there, thank you, thank you tonight on the side. Other, at the back, thank you. Others tonight, thank you, just give me a wave right now. Wherever you're seated tonight, slip your hand up. Come on, if you haven't done so already, right now is your moment. This will change not something, but everything about your life. Quickly, so look one more time, from the front to the back, from the left to the right, looking right now, slip those hands up and say, you know what, that's me tonight. I need to change my believing because I'm believing that God is my answer tonight. Quickly, one more time as I look to some people struggling. Thank you, great decision right there. Right there. Come on, who's that last person? I feel just one more person just going, you know what, I'm fighting this through. This is, God's waiting for you right now. Would you just lift your hand wherever you're seated right now. So you know what, thank you. Great decision in the middle there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great clap tonight. You can look up right now, right across the room, people made decisions that will change not just a part of their life, but everything about their life. Because our world is determined not by what truth is, but by our reality. And now that you believe in a God that is real, a God that does care, then you're gonna enter into the world He has for you because your believing has now changed. Let's give it up for Him. Let's get excited for Him. So you know what, great decisions here tonight.
And if you did make a decision tonight, and maybe you didn't lift your hand, but in your heart, you thought, you know, I should have done that. There are yellow, I have decided to follow Jesus cards in the pockets in front of you right there. Uh, uh, slip those things out during the service. There's a pencil in there as well. Fill out the details. And near the end of the service, we're gonna have an offering and containers are gonna come past. And if you wanna drop those cards filled out into the containers, uh, then we will be in touch with you about your next steps and uh, what it means to go on from here. Uh, so uh, please do that. And again, if you didn't slip your hand up, you know, on your heart, you said, you know what, I need to move forward, fill one of those out and put it in the offering buckets as they go around uh, because we want to be in touch with you and help you move onto the great future that you have. Your believing determines your realities, no doubt about it. Uh, this week, we're going to see a football game between New South Wales and Queensland. <laughs> And now, I've been to so many football games over the years and what I love about football is crowds. I love that, 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 that they don't see through their eyes, they see what they believe. In other words, you can have something going on in the field and the New South Wales people are going off, they can't believe you did that, that's wrong. And all the Queenslanders going, he's been doing it all night and the whole thing. You can put it up on the big screen seven times and no one changes their point of view. They know it's Queensland to still believe He did it. It's the same thing, why? Because the truth is we don't see with our eyes, we see through our eyes. All right, you don't see with them, you see through them. In other words, you'll believe, you see what you are believing. Your belief system allows you to see the world around you. It determines how you see and view things and how your world's gonna end up. You see with your believing, you change your believing and you start to change the way you see. I know many people that used to support New South Wales so powerfully and significantly, but eight years later, eight years later, they're starting to go, you know what? Queensland's an awesome team. Why? Because they changed their believing, they're starting to see right. They were living a lie before. But now they're seeing the truth and they've been set free from a blue demon. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna send Joel over to see you. He'll cast that thing out. <laughs> you see, with your believing with your belief in changing the way you see life, the way you respond to life, the way your reality is determined. Often, when our reality is not going well, when things are going badly for us, we start to think that it's everybody else's fault. We think, uh, you know, this is happening, that's happening, it's all going wrong. It's, it's believing that, that, uh, that we're doing, you know, that, that things are all going wrong because when our believing's out of whack, it seems like everything else is the problem. And the truth is oftentimes the problem is not everything else, it's not everybody else, it's just something wrong with our believing. And it's in that place when we start to find that if we can deal with that part of our soul, the problems start to get fixed up. We think the problem is everybody, everywhere, everything, but the truth is often it's just inside of us. I remember the story of a guy goes to a doctor and he says to the doctor, I said, I don't know what's wrong with me, but man, I, I got pain in my body. Every time I press on myself, it hurts. I, 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 I press my head, oh, and the pain. And then uh, you know, I, I press my stomach and man, it's sore. Uh, and then I, then I press my knee, man, and it still hurts. And the doctor's quite bemused by this, got no idea what's going wrong. So he does all the x-rays and looks at him all and does the whole you know, thing, gives him all the tests. And uh, he finally gets back together with him. And he says, I found out the reason for the pain. He said, well, what is it? He said, well, no, your body's fine. It's your finger that's broken. So every time you press yourself, it hurts. Doesn't matter where you press, it hurts. Your finger's broken, not your body. And our believing is like that finger. If your believing is broken or wrong, then everything around you seems wrong or broken. And it's when you fix that up, you start to get in the right place and things start to look better. It starts to work out better. It wasn't out there. It was more what happened about what we believe. And we've got to make sure, so you can, you can believe the wrong, th wrong thing and be very sincere. I mean, really sincere. You, you, you could believe that this meeting starts at 6.30 every Sunday night and you believe that. And because you believe it, what do you do? You turn up at seven o'clock and the point is, 
And the point is you sincerely believe it. So your outer reality is acted out on that believing. But you can be sincerely wrong with your believing. And there are many people that aren't intentionally wrong. It's just they're believing is sincerely the wrong things. And therefore they're living in the wrong reality. Our believing is like that finger. You start to fix it up. You start to get that right and things start to work out. Your believing creates your reality. And the good news is, this is the good news about this whole thing, is that you can believe the right things and it can take you to a place you've never dreamed of. If you get your believing in the right context, things you never thought possible can start to evolve and start to move in you and through you. Uh, what I thought I'd do for a few minutes, if you weren't in Heart 2014, if you were, we had uh, uh, Pastor Jesse DePlantis with us and, um, and he spoke this message on Thursday and I was just out and it's a word because I got up and he was gonna preach something. I did the offering and, and because he, I, something I said in the offering, he changed his whole message. And it was like a word to the church. And, uh, and I thought it was powerful because it takes me now, it'll, it'll lay the platform for the second half of my message. So let's look at the screen. Uh, Jesse had a plan, us Heart 2014. The reason I, I put that up there is that again, there's the concept of what you believe determines your reality. And as believers, we've got to get into a position where we start to have our mind renewed in a very powerful way to see, break, to see breakthrough, to see increase, to see abundance. It starts all about with what we believe about it. Uh, Ephesians chapter four, verse 23 says this, and it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Not, not in your head, not in your thinking, be renewed in the spirit. It talks about your heart. And if you're renewed in the spirit of your heart about your believing, then different things start to happen in your world. And the Bible goes on, as we heard Pastor Jesse talk about, clearly indicates that the Kingdom of God is built around giving and receiving, sowing and reaping. The concept of a seed, the, the, why we call something a seed is because seed is designed to do certain things. A seed has the ability to multiply when planted. So when we think of the word seed, we think of pawpaws, oranges, whatever it is. It's a seed, it contains life. It contains life that can be multiplied. And the Bible speaks very clearly that if we're gonna see the blessing of the increase of God around our lives, then we only need to stand the seed harvest principle. John chapter 12, uh, verse 24 says this, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies or it gives itself, it produces much grain. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and gives itself, it will stand alone. Nothing comes of that. But when it gives itself, when it sows itself, there's an abundance of harvest that becomes possible. When we ask God to do something in our lives, or we ask God to give us something, His response is based on that principle. It's never changed, it never will change. Every time you say, God, send this or do this or whatever you want from God, His response will always be the seed, the same, because it's all brought down to seed and harvest. When we ask God to do something, when we ask God to give us something, His first response to us is, what will you do with something you already have? The seed, what, what will you do with the seed that I've given you? And it doesn't matter what you think about what seed is, that you understand if it's got the power to be planted, if it's got the power to reproduce, to multiply, then it is a seed. And what God's asking then is this, what will you do with that seed of faith I've given you? What will, God, what will you do with that seed of love that I've given you? What is that, that seed of hope that I've given you? Uh, uh, your prayer life, that seed of prayer, your time, your gifts, your talents, your finances, that seed. What will you do with something I have already given you to see the harvest or the thing you wanna to come to pass? And the reason this is important and the reason we've not just gotta have it in our head, but believe it in our heart is because of this. Now listen, nothing comes from heaven until first something is given on earth. Nothing comes from heaven. God will always work on the seed principle. Something has to be planted. Something has to be given away. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, it remains alone. But if it gives itself, it produces much fruit. And the context is that if you're gonna ask God to do something great in your life or even for somebody else, that's why we pray. We don't just hope somebody gets healed. We don't just wish or think about it. We actually pray because first something has to be given on earth before something comes from heaven. It's a seed harvest principle. And if we start to get our believing wrapped around this, then every time we want God to do something, we work out first there's gonna be a seed. 
If we need something from God, first is gonna be a seed that He requires. Our faith, our prayer life, our love, our encouragement. There's always gonna be something given. Right throughout the Bible, let's have a look at 1 Kings. Chapter 17, verse 10. And uh, it's the story of Elijah. And it says this. So Elijah rose and he went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have any bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat and then we'll die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a cake from it first and bring it to me. And whatever's left, make it for yourself and for your son. Right here, you see this incredible concept, bring me your, <laughs> it's, like, it's like me coming to your place and you've got nothing left. I mean, you're down to nothing. And I said, you know, man, it's really sad you've got nothing left. All I've got, is a, all I've got is one muffin left. All I've got is one muffin. And I said, well, that's really sad. Do you mind if I eat it? Can you bring it to me? Oh, and, and a cup of water, yeah, can you? Uh, I mean, this is, how, this is how we can get it mixed up. We can go, well, you know, gee, the church is having their big faith, love and hope offering next weekend and uh, uh, they don't care what I'm going through. They, man, they're asking me to, to give something there. And Man, I've got hardly enough to get through the door. I've got hardly enough to make it to next week. And here, the church is just after my money. I can imagine her, you know, she could have stood there and said, well, you don't look so bad off, prophet. Fancy robe and a big camel. You're doing okay. See, she could have thought like that. Starving widow. That's your last bit, is it? That's all I have. Well, I'll take that. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll have that. I'll take that. And whatever's left, you can have for yourself. But she gave what she had, the Bible says. You see, God never asks you to give something you don't have. God will never ask you to put a seed in the ground that it's not possible. You can only do something with what you do have. And this is what's so significant about God is that everybody has something to sow so blessing can be given. Even if it's a bit of hope, even if it's a bit of prayer, even if it's a bit of faith, every one of us has a seed that if planted can take us into the next level God has for us. So all of us can be blessed. It's only a matter of what we're prepared to do with the seed. I mean, the truth is she could have kept it. She should have said, on your bike. Uh -uh. Son and me, man, we're eating this last bit because that's what we've got. We know that we're gonna die, it says. We understand that. She could have given that. But right, listen to the context of this. If she had said that, if she said, you know what? This is mine. I'm keeping it for myself. Then whatever size it was, that's the most it would ever be. But when she decided to give it to the prophet, when she said, you know what? You're the prophet of God, here it is. Take my last bit of cake, my last drink of water. Take that thing. You know what? Instead of it being the least it would ever be, right? Sorry, being the most it would ever be. Right now, as she sown it, as she gave it, it now became the least it would ever be. Because it was sown, because it was given, it had changed its value considerably. Not because the amount had changed. If she kept it, most it would ever be one muffin. Give it, and it's the least it would ever be. The value hadn't changed or the size hadn't changed, but the value had changed, why? Because now it became a seed. It became something that would be sowed and that would be given. It seems to me that the miraculous, the victory is always on the other side of the obedience to what God says to do. When He says, so it's okay. Not that poor widow could have said, no, I'm gonna keep it. You could say, you know what, I haven't got much. But the point is, I'm not after your money. The prophet wasn't after her money. He was after a breakthrough for her life. He wanted the best thing to happen for her. And if you know the rest of the story, man, she gives that thing. And I tell you what, it's incredible. Something takes place where she doesn't run out of food for the rest of her days. She is, she is above everybody else. She is blessed beyond measure because she sowed something that was the seed that she had. You mightn't think you've got enough, enough but you've got something. You've got something. Well, Mark, I'm only a, a uni student. I've got $10. Well, I might be a... A grade 10, all I've got is $5. But 
but we've all got something. And when we keep it, it stays the most it will ever be. But when it's sown into kingdom purposes, it becomes the least that it will ever be. It only goes up from there. Something given on earth, then blessing is released from heaven. Second Kings chapter four. This is the next prophet. This is Elijah, Elisha, Elisha, who grew up under Elijah, who learned the context. And so he's out there and he goes to this place and there's a certain woman in, in 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, a certain woman of the, wives of, the, of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. The creditor has come to take my two sons to be his slaves. Now, some people might think that's not a bad deal. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me what you have in your house. Tell me what you want me to do. Tell me what you have. And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house. Oh, oh, hang on. Um, I've got, no, I think I've got a jar of oil. Then he said, go and borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbours, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you've come in, you should shut the door behind you and your sons and then pour it into all these vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went out from him and the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels in and she started to pour it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's none left. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil, pay your debt and you and your sons will live fine for the rest of your lives. What do you have? Well, nothing. Oh, hang on, I do have something. Breakthrough is always initiated when we realise that we have enough to take us to the next level. And when, we, when we see that it mightn't be much, but it's enough in God's hands to take us there. I don't seem to have much, but you do have something. And for heaven to be moved, something first must be given on earth. Gather as many jars as you can. You write something down. This is the one you write down. The size of your expectation governs the size of your breakthrough. The size of your ex, go and don't, don't get a few jars, get a lot of jars. And, and it, that'll, if she just kept bringing jars, that thing wouldn't have stopped. She would have run Caltex by now. I mean, it would have been going. It just would have kept on going, but it says, is there another jar? No, we've run out then. That was the end of that and the oil ceased. So and believe equals breakthrough. So and believe equals breakthrough. The last story, the last principle this is that I wanna cover is Luke chapter nine tonight. And uh, verse 13 through 17, and it's the story of Jesus feeding 5,000. I, I love the context, everything about this story. Uh, it just shouts the generosity of God and the bigness of God, but let's read it. But He said to them, to the disciples, you give them some to eat. <laughs> and they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then there was women and children. Then He said to, go, then he said to His disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so, they made them all sit down. Then He took the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, He blessed them, <laughs> He broke them and gave them to His disciples and set them before the multitude. So they all ate, <laughs> they all ate and they were filled. And not only were they filled, there were 12 basketfuls of leftovers were taken up after everybody was filled up. Not El Chipo, El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. Jesus feeds over 5,000 people. You notice the food didn't fall from the sky because He didn't want a hail damaged crowd. It didn't fall out of the sky, it just didn't turn up. It wasn't McDonald's was open. It was there was nothing there. And to feed the 5,000 people plus, 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 they, Jesus said there's gotta be, He's got, there's got to be something we can give. You see, he didn't, just, he didn't just wish it. He didn't rub a, a genie-like lamp. He didn't make an abracadabra sound. He said, you know what? If we want to feed these 5,000 plus people, there must be something here on earth that can be given. And when that is given, we will see the wonder of God. A young boy says, you know what? I've got a few loaves and a couple of fish mum packed for lunch. I'm happy to give them. And you give those sort of things to Jesus and miracles start to take place. 
He blesses it, He multiplies it, He breaks it. And I don't know about you, but I, I have no context of how you felt as He broke your little bit of bread and said, go and feed those people. Here's a little bit of fish, you go and feed that 4,000 people. You go and feed that with that. I don't, as a disciple, I'll be going, I mean, what do you do when you've got a, a little bit of bread and there's 5,000 hungry people? And as they reached out in faith, as there was something was sown, as they believed Jesus, as they went there, the world's biggest sushi train went into effect. Baker's delight on steroids. All of a sudden there was food galore. Not only just galore, everybody was filled and there was still 12 basket fill, fulls, filled, ready to be packed up and given to somebody else. Hey, if something is given on earth, then something can be released from heaven. If you can not just know this, but start to believe this, you now enter a level of faith like Jesse DePlan has spoke about, where it's not about your want, your needs, it's about what you want. And if you get what you want, your needs are taken care of automatically. You live in a new place, not of greed, but of growth. You have more than enough. You're in a place to not be a victim, but a victor, not to be a consumer, but a producer to the world around you. And it's all built around our concept about what we believe. Your believing determines your reality. If you can't believe this, you'll never see it outworked. But if you start with right believing, and then you take that seed, whatever it is, and you give and you sow it, because a seed, the reason it's called a seed, because it has the power to multiply. That's why it's called seed. That's why money is a seed, because when you invest it, it multiplies. That's why you can call money seed. Right believing start to sow with faith and give with expectancy, then breakthrough, then release, then miracles will start to be your bread. And it will happen on the other side of our obedience to what the Word of God says, to God's eternal truths. Are we ready to believe? Are we ready to expect? Are we ready to sow? Are we ready to give? And in that context, that puts us in a place where we can believe our way into breakthrough for our generation, our nation and the world that we live in. Tonight.